Uh, yes, I'm Andrew Klein, not Andrew Shaw. Andrew Shaw's from Vanderbilt, but that's fine, no problem. And I do come from Cambridge in the UK, and I'm going to talk about death. And I put up anesthesiologist for you, although we say anesthetist. And the question is, does the anesthesiologist make a, di make a difference? And this is a very interesting story uh, that we went on over a few years. And it all started off with the surgeon saying, you killed my patient. And how many times they say, it's your fault, you killed my patient. It's not my fault. The hole in the aorta, the patient bled to death. It's the anesthesiologist's fault because the patient was bleeding. So time after time in our m and meetings, the surgeon blames the anaesthetist. So we did, decided to undergo a big statistical way to see whether the anaesthesiologist actually did kill the surgeon's patients. Um, so I'll take you through that journey. Uh, I have some conflicts of interest, the main one being, as Michael said, I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, the UK journal, uh, Anesthesia, which is the white one that you see here. Uh, and we're pleased to say our impact factor has gone up uh, over the last uh, year or two, and we'd welcome your uh, submissions, and we also enjoy submitting to ACTA, to your journal. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to present in your session. So I'm going to talk about death after surgery. What factors are associated with death? Does the surgeon matter? And does the anesthesiologist matter? And Jim Morrison said this, uh, so he didn't fear death. Personally, I don't fear death myself. I fear retirement and having nothing to do more than death. You may disagree, you may, may fear disability or pain or death, uh, everyone varies. And death after surgery is an outcome that is open to question. It has been a very important outcome over the last 10 or 15 years, but people are not so interested in mortality as an outcome. They're now more interested in death and disability, days alive and out of hospital, rather than death on its own. And there are many causes of death after surgery, and you can think of all these. They may be the patient themselves, the country in which they're looked after, treated, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the hospital they're operated on, some may be better or worse than others, and perhaps the day of the week on which they were treated. So the patient themselves, we have lots of different risk scores, and I'm going to use throughout this sort of statistical tour of death, the Euro score, which was developed in 22 countries in Europe, over 100,000 patients, and it's very well validated. We now use Euroscore 2 by one of my colleagues from Papworth, Sam Nasheff. And all these things are on Euroscore. And you can go online, and any patient having cardiac surgery, you can work out their risk of death using Euroscore 2. Uh, and we tell that to our patients in the clinic, uh, and we calculate that for all our patients. In the US, they use d a different score. Uh, but in Australia, they have their own score. But in Europe, we use Euroscore 2. This is a very interesting study. This has had more letters to the Lancet than many others, uh, and made more calls for it to be retracted than a number of other studies, but it hasn't been retracted. Uh, it's very unpopular when I have presented a slide coming up in another country, and you can guess which one, uh, from the bottom of the list, I was nearly hounded out. Uh, most of the Scandinavian countries did very well. They collected very good data for this study, which was in 2011. Nearly 500 hospitals, nearly 30 countries, 46,000 patients operated on over that week, and a crude mortality of 4%, which varied from 1.2% in Iceland to 21.5% in Latvia. And you can guess in Riga this didn't go down very well. And there's the UK, which was the reference point, and you can see that most of the Scandinavian countries are near the top of that list although the only one that was statistically significantly better than average was Finland. And there were four or five countries that were statistically significantly worse than average, uh, one of them being Latvia. Uh, now, this was a problematic study because only about 40 patients from Latvia were included, whereas several thousand from the UK were and from the Scandinavian countries. You can see from the size of the confidence intervals how many patients were included because the tighter they were, the more patients they included. And that's why the UK one is so tight as well as because it's the reference one. And basically it was all to do with data. So the stuff you put in is the stuff you get out. The better data you put in, the better data you get out. And of course, when one or two hospitals only in Latvia collected data and were able to input it, and they happened to be hospitals that had a, you know, quite a few deaths, very sick patients in that time, they got this very high mortality of 21%. And so they're furious about that because most of the hospitals in the country weren't offered the chance to put data in. And they felt that it's unrepresentative of their healthcare system. Uh, so it really is a 
doesn't tell us much about their system as such. So it doesn't t stop you going to Latvia to have your operation, although you may wish to go to Finland if you believe their data. So I've talked about the country. What about the hospital? Well, in the UK, we have an independent think tank called Dr. Foster, which looks at mortality in every single hospital in the UK. And it's been responsible for blowing the lid on several scandals, including one that was in the session yesterday, uh, the Mid-Stafford scandal, where the mortality was significantly higher over a period of five years. And in the UK, the most recent Dr. Foster study shows that out of 360 hospitals, two have higher than expected deaths after surgery and two have lower. And Cambridge is one of those ones that's lower, as, although tw by 25% as a relative term. Uh, and the other one is Chelsea and Westminster in, in London. So, so two hospitals in the UK have a lower mortality than expected. Um, now, whether you believe that is because they're better hospitals or not, we'll come to that later. This was a very controversial paper in the BMJ on day of the week, which was written by uh, or co-authored by some people in the government in the UK, and it looked at 30-day uh, mortality based on day of the week of surgery. And it, this is used in Parliament as a stick to beat doctors within the UK to say that we should be working Saturdays and Sundays as well as Monday to Fridays. So this is the paper that is being called for for the seven-day NHS. So the general practitioners should work at the weekends and surgeons and anesthesiologists should work at the weekends. And of course, that is more expensive, uh, but the government thinks they can do it for free uh, by just changing our work schedules. Uh, and they looked at all elective surgery over three years in the UK NHS, and they made up their own risk score. Well, in fact, they really didn't risk score it at all. They called it a comorbidity score uh, using socioeconomic deprivation. Uh, so they had no recognized risk score at all. And this is what they found. This is what's been put up in the House of Parliament, that Saturday and Sunday, you're nearly twice as likely to die if you're operated on those days. But of course, the problem is they used all elective surgery. That includes colonoscopy, gastroscopy, inguinal hernias, toenail removals, varicose veins. And all those surgeries are very often done Monday to Friday. But on a Saturday and sur Sunday, the hernia operation that you get is an incarcerated, strangulated hernia. And it's very different from the hernia that you get on a Monday or Tuesday. And the gastroscopies you get on a Saturday and Sunday are bleeding to use as opposed to a straightforward diagnostic. So very fewer patients were operated on on Saturday and Sunday and a completely different cohort of patients. They weren't at all matched. And so the reason for this whole study was that the surgery done at the weekend is just different. We know that from our hospitals. Um, and they didn't use any sort of validated risk scoring system it was completely biased. They included all the day cases when no day case is done at the weekend. So it's, it's a terrible study, and yet this is used to formulate health policy. So as a journal editor, it's scary that such absolutely appalling science is used to validate health policy. Okay, so we've talked about hospitals, day of the week, pa uh, patients, and then surgeons. So in the UK, I don't know if this is the case in all Scandinavian countries, that we publish nationally on the internet, in the open, mortality for every single surgeon and every single centre. So you can look up your surgeon and see what their mortality is uh, in their practice. And this is nationally funded. Uh, it's risk adjusted using Euroscore. And every hospital has to enter this data or they lose their license to practice. So here is the data from the most recent one, uh, and you can see these are the hospitals themselves. And my hospital is the busiest in the UK, so we're right on the right. And we're lower than expected mortality, but not statistically better. And you can see everyone was statistically the same, apart from three hospitals, two of which have now closed. So this data is published in the public it, for cardiac surgery, and if there's unacceptable variation, this is used to close hospitals or merge them. So again, this is used to formulate health policy, and it makes unpopular decisions more palatable to the public if they're closed. So the government believes that the actual hospital matters, and I'm going to come to that as well in a minute. And this is the individual surgeons, and you can see if you're an individual surgeon, you're on this graph, and your individual data is sent to you and is published on the internet. And if you go above the blue dotted line, a letter goes to your boss and says that your performance is deteriorating and you need to be mentored. And if you go above the red line, you're no longer working. You're no longer paid a salary. 
your kids have to go hungry, you just have to sell your house, your wife leaves you, if you had a wife because you're a surgeon. And so this is a big deal for surgeons. This is a big deal. They live or die based on this. So we present this monthly in our hospital, and it really is. If you go to the surgeons' meetings, they close the doors and they argue about it. And now I think 90% of the surgeons in the UK want to stop this because it causes huge issues. The chair, the chief of the cardiothoracic surgeons in the UK lost his job as a result of issues to do with mortality data. So this is a huge deal and they live or die on it. And so they said, it's not our fault, it's your fault. We'd like the government to introduce the same system for anaesthetists, anesthesiologists, and the bad ones should lose their job as well. Wow. So we said, what's the evidence that anesthesiologists make a difference? This is the surgical thing. Before we go down the process of ripping ourselves apart as a society of anesthesiologists and losing people because of deaths in their practice, we need to know the evidence, the statistical evidence, because this is our jobs and our families. And we're usually with the same family, unlike the surgeons. So is there a direct effect or an indirect effect of the anesthesiologist? Well, here's my data. And you can see that over 140 cases I anesthetized, I had two deaths, and that's my VLAD score. And you can see that my mortality, expected mortality, was 4% better than average, which was statistically within 95% confidence intervals. So my chief executive says I'm okay. And this is the rest of my department. You can see everybody in the anesthesiology department at my hospital is doing better than expected. So if you look for me, I'm the one whose line ends at 141, and you can see I'm up there with the, maybe the best anesthesiologist in my department. I'm certainly not the worst or the best. Dr. Mackay, who's my colleague, who's always best, his green line is at 7.5%. Uh, you can see he does very well. He didn't have a single death in his care that year. So is that important? And should we be looking at that on a yearly basis as part of our job planning? That was the other question we looked at. While we were looking at it, this paper from the US came out in anesthesia and analgesia from New York State. And they looked at all the anesthesiologists in New York State, and they found that those in red were statistically significantly more likely to kill their patients than those down the bottom. That's a lot of anesthesiologists there, a lot of them. And so New York State saw this data published in anesthesia and analgesia and mandated the data should be collected and published for New York anesthesiologists. And it was then going to go into all the other states in the US on a, on a sequential basis. So the anesthesiologists in New York suddenly started getting very scared about their data and what would happen if they were one of those ones in red that I've highlighted for you. And this was hugely trumpeted by anesthesia and analgesia with not one or two, but five editorials on the day of publication. Now, we've never had five editorials. We've never had more than one, and I know you don't either. But five editorials all said the same thing. This is amazing data. This is world-breaking, revolutionary study that changes the face of anesthesiologists' understanding of... You can see anesthesiologists make a difference. Making a difference. Cardiac surgery, all for one and one for all. So these five editorials. So just as they published theirs, we published ours a few weeks later... And uh, this is our paper in anesthesia. Uh, and uh, this was how we did it. We looked at, sorry, this was in about 7,500 patients in the US. We looked at about 120,000 patients in the UK over 10 years to look at the difference between individual anesthesiologists practicing in the UK. And our aim was to see whether we should publish that data in the national forum as the surgeons did. So that was a very simple aim. And we collected data on 110,000 patients, 193 anesthesiologists, and 124 surgeons. So, so a lot of, lot of people over 10 years. And you can see that the sizes of the centers differed. Papworth is center number one where I work because we did the most patients, so it's quite easy to see. And there was our mortality, 3.1% mortality. So this was the unadjusted crude mortality. And there was some variation, but obviously, as we know, it's not risk-adjusted. So those are the crude mortality for our center was 3.1, center number two, 2.8, and these were anonymized, published anonymized. This is a standard cardiac surgical patient, 66 years of age, logistic Euroscore of seven, and 70 odd percent male. 
50% of our surgeries are isolated coronary glass. This was our statistical methodology. I'm sorry to bore you with biostatistics. I won't do it as much as Angus did because I'm not as good at it as his. Uh, but this is a three-level cross-classification uh, random effects regression analysis. So in other words, the effect of the surgeon you work with does matter. So that combination of surgeon anesthesiologist, if you work with one surgeon, it's different from working another surgeon. If you work in one hospital, it's different to another. You have a different ICU set up, a different OR set up, different perfusionists, and so on and so forth. So each one interacts with each other who interacts with the patient. So you need to take that into account and that any possible interaction, even if there's no difference, both surgeons are brilliant, there's still an interaction. So this is a random effects model to take into account those effects and randomize them, and three levels because it's surgeon, anesthesiologist, and patient at uh, center, hospital, all affecting the, the patient. So the patient's uh, outcome is affected by those three things. And uh, you have to use a random effects model because of those three uh, covariates. So uh, two distinct three-level models were used for surgeon anesthetist controlling for the center. And our outcome was death up to three months post-operatively. So here is our data. And you can see the one on the left looks quite similar to that US one that was in anesthesiology a and &A. But the one on the right is actually the final one when you adjust for the individual surgeon. So with the two-level cross-classification model, you get a different to the three-level cross-classification set. And you can see that, in fact, in the UK, out of 193 anesthesiologists, we're all the same. Not one anesthesiologist kills more patients than the other. Over 10 years, using a random effects model. Not one. So I'm not better than the rest. I'm the same. But what it means is nobody's worse than the rest, and nobody would or should lose their job based on that data. So that's very important. And looking at the surgeon, it's not the same. So the le score on the left and the score on the right the, the graphs, they look very similar because the anesthesiologist does not affect the mortality, but the surgeon does. So you can see there are quite a number of surgeons above the line who perhaps should not be operating on, operating on patients, and there are a few below the line who, who really should be teaching everybody else how to bloody do it. So there is a significant difference between the top surgeons and the bottom surgeons, whereas there was no significant difference between the top and the bottom anesthesiologists. Okay, And if you look at the center, this is one of those is me in my hospital. I'm the same as everyone in my hospital. So those graphs I showed you at the beginning of my scores, there's no point. I'm the same. In other words, we're all equally bad or equally good, but we don't, none of us are better than the other in my hospital. Look how incredible they are. But when you take a look at the surgeons, Look at that, you have some of our uh, surgeons who should be stopped operating in my hospital, but some who are absolutely brilliant. So, this is the main slide. The surgeon accounts for, the patient accounts for nearly 96% of their own mortality. So the risk of death in hospital is attributed to the patient themselves. In other words, their age, their gender, their size, the number of times they've been operated on before, the severity of their disease, how poor their ventricular function is. Many things you can't change, but the patient attributes themselves that risk. The surgeon accounts for a small but significant amount, 4%, and the anesthesiologist, virtually none, and the hospital, none. So the difference between one hospital and another comes from their surgeons. So if you take our three best surgeons and you take them to one of those hospitals that was shut down and put them there, those hospitals would suddenly become one of the best hospitals in the UK. So it's not the hospital, and it's not the anesthesiologist. It's the patients. So this is a big study, a robust statistical methodology. We say that our study has validated law number four of the house of God. If you've never read The House of God, it's very entertaining. I read it when I was a medical student, and it changed my life. And uh, it, it has a number of laws. Did you read it? A number of laws. The first law is uh, there's no body cavity you can't reach with a long, without a needle and a good strong arm. Number four is the patient is the one with the disease. So 25 or 30 years ago, Samuel Shem was right. The risk is attributed to the patient. 
So we say that this validates specialist training in the UK in cardiac anesthesiology is fit for purpose because every of my consultant colleagues is performing at a high level and we have no consultants performing at a low level. And the surgeons, they're different. So this has left, the government has then decided not to publish our data at a national level. So my data is not published on the internet and the surgeon still is. So this has perhaps changed because if somebody was to have a bad year and a few patients died in their care, they may have lost their jobs. When in fact, as you can see statistically, they shouldn't have lost their jobs. It was the surgeon they're working with rather than them. So we feel that this has led to a lot of trauma being saved for our colleagues. And as far as the anesthesia and analgesia paper goes, it created a storm of letters, including one from ourselves. They used a uh, fixed effects model, and their graph was all wrong. They didn't control for the surgeon and the center in their, in their uh, statistical analysis. About nine letters were published, and in the end, Steve Schaefer, as his final action as editor-in-chief, wrote this editorial, Broken Hearts, describing how he was broken-hearted that he had to retract this paper uh, and um, he didn't, in fact, retract the five editorials that were published with it, which is interesting. Uh, and he allowed the authors to publish uh, a new paper on the same day as it was retracted with the f uh, a two-level cross-classification model, a random effects model, and they then found the same as we had in our study, that there was no effect of the anesthesiology. But it still got a mistake, because they didn't control for the center, so it's a two-level, and they showed that there was a hospital difference across New York State. But I've lost the will to, to fight <laughs> with this paper. So it should still be retracted, again, because they did the wrong statistical analysis and the hospital performance is not different if they did a three-level classification. But, you know, after the five editorials, I can't be bothered anymore. So actually, mortality is not the outcome to look at anesthesiologist performance. We should perhaps look at morbidity cardiac morbidity, acute kidney injury, pain, nausea and vomiting. So mortality is not the right outcome. And there are other cohorts of patients in which the anesthesiologist may make more of a difference, such as trauma, orthopedics, emergency laparotomy. So this is it, that's the end of my talk. I've talked about death, surgeons, anesthesiologists. So pick your surgeon when you have your surgery. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. You have a free shot at me and my name in public <laughs> at any time. <clears throat> One quick question. Go ahead, Angus. So I'm only asking this to be controversial. You said that the anesthesiologists were fit for purpose because they were all performing at a high level. But in fact, all you showed was that they were all performing at the same level. Correct. As you know, they weren't all equally bad. Well, I have taken some of the slides out of there. And what it showed is that the, uh, the mortality across the UK should have gone up over the last 10 years because our patients are older and sicker. And you, we know that. Our patients are all getting older and sicker. But the actual mortality from cardiac surgery over the last 10 years has decreased. It's a success story from 4.5% 10 years ago to about 2.5%. So in fact, our patients are doing much, much better than the just Euroscore, Euroscore 2. So they may all be very bad, and it may be the surgeons that are saving their lives, or it may be the beta blockers or the statins. But actually, patients are doing much better than expected as a whole. So it's unlikely that they're all bad. Uh, so all it does is it means that we're all equally well trained. But whether that's good or bad, I, c I can't tell you. But it, as I say, it's a success story for patients. Okay, thanks again, Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.